I thought that the day my story came out, my ministry would be over. Turns out that's the day it started. Reputation was everything for me. I set out uh, to build a good reputation and to protect it, which meant that there were parts of my life that I couldn't let anybody see. There were some battles I had to fight alone. I got my first look at hardcore pornography on a seminary-sponsored trip to New York City. My wife was with me. They took us on a tour of Times Square so that we could see firsthand how women are exploited by the sex business. I was shocked by what I saw and disgusted by it. But I was also fascinated. It hit me, hooked me deep. I didn't just like porn. I became obsessed with it, and it eventually took me places I never intended to go. So before I know it, I'm a, I'm a pastor, married, three kids, and I'm picking up my first hooker on my way to lead a candlelight service on Christmas Eve. I only lasted five years in the ministry. I was never caught, but I was terrified of losing my reputation. My life was out of control. I'd lost any hope that I could stop what I was doing, so I bailed on the ministry, went into business, succeeded in business. But that's about the only thing I succeeded at. Those were dark years. My life got smaller and smaller. I hated what I was doing. I remember so many times screaming at God as I pulled away from some place I shouldn't have been, banging on the steering wheel, saying, take this away, I don't want to do this anymore. He never answered that prayer. Eventually I concluded that either he didn't care or he didn't exist. Today, I'm so glad he didn't answer that prayer. I think we're all made for intimacy, but intimacy carries its risks. People can reject us, people can disappear, they can die. Pornography offers this artificial intimacy with no risks. So every day I said hello to the, to the woman who wouldn't laugh at me or who found me attractive, engaging. And every day I gave a piece of myself away. It left me emptier and hungrier every time. And yet I kept coming back. I was oblivious to what it was doing to my wife until one day she caught me. I don't know how long she'd been standing there, but she was crying. And so I apologized and we talked it through. And I was still afraid. A few days later, she found a, a condom on the floor in the bathroom that I couldn't quite explain. This time, she didn't cry. She sat me down on the edge of our bed and she said, I'm done. I still love you, but I don't like you. I don't trust you. I don't respect you. And I don't believe you can ever change. That's what it took for me to get out of my private world. Living in the truth, walking in the light, no matter how other people might perceive it, I mean, that's, that's freedom. And to know that I'm, I don't have to perform to be accepted, 
I always felt bad that I wasn't a better person. I even created this false self, this Saint Nate, that I tried to breathe on its own. I felt bad that, that Saint Nate could only live at church. Now I know that Jesus never loved Saint Nate because he didn't make Saint Nate. He made me. Jesus loves me, wants a relationship with me. And that's the only real relationship there is. There's a tremendous liberty when you arrive in a place that's safe enough to bring your real self and say the real truth. They were men who did that for me, Christian men. And I found that I could give the same gift to another guy, sit down over a cup of coffee and just tell him my story. And even if his life is different from mine, and everybody's life is different from mine in the details, something about my story resonated with his. And so many times, by the time we finished, he'd say, well, you know, I've never told anybody this, but you got a taste of freedom too. Because of my addiction, I now understand that but only God is the center of things. He's actually used my addiction for good. Because of it, I've been forced to join the human race and surrender to a power greater than myself. God is good. God is love. And if I'll follow the path that he's laid out for me, I can live every day in the warmth of his love, and I can reflect it to others. I don't think I ever really met Jesus until I stepped out of my, my church persona and became just another desperate, broken man. That's when he really became real to me. This isn't the ministry I've, I planned. But I know it's mine, and, uh, and my wife knows it too. We're in it together. My wife will tell you today that she's been married to two guys named Nate Larkin. And as hard as those first 20 years were, she'd take him again to get the last 10. I'm Nate Larkin, and I am second. It's surreal for me to see that. I haven't seen that in years. Uh, it wasn't 10 years ago, because it was 13 years ago. <laughs> Some guys overheard me in a coffee shop telling my story to another guy. And they, they walked up and interrupted and said, hey, we're putting together a website. With, we want real Christians telling their real stories. Would, would, you, would you be willing to tell your story to a camera? And I said, yes. That took an hour. Um, we had started the Samson Society by then. There were 50 guys in the Samson Society when that film was made. Today, there are 15,000 guys in the Samson Society. Um, <clears throat> you know, it's difficult when you grow up. I don't know how many of you guys grew up in church. Even if you don't grow up in church, you grow up in a post-Christian or a Christian culture. If you live in the South, you probably live around churchianity. It's all acculturated. And, and we're given this lens to read everything through, a filter. And with that lens and with that filter, it's difficult to hear, much less believe, the gospel. It always gets retranslated into... Do better, try harder. God is really disappointed in you. Um, <clears throat> when my wife caught me, uh, we had lived, by the way, in South Florida for 16 years. That's where my 
uh, addiction really took off, reconstructing it later. The, bear in mind, this is back in the days before Tinder and before internet porn. So if you wanted it, you had to pay for it. Today, if you're paying for porn, you're doing it wrong. But back then, uh, <laughs> back then, if you wanted porn, you had to go find it. You took a risk. If you were a pastor, you took a risk doing it. Uh, and so there was always a little bit of adrenaline rush along with the dopamine cascade. A, 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 a nice big payoff there um, in my risky behavior, which then accelerated to, to hookers. And then reconstructing it later after I left the ministry, always, by the way, active in church, even after I left the ministry, always active in church. God, I love church. Um, and it seemed like in church I could be the person or pretend to be the person I aspired to be. Um, yeah, reconstructing it later with the help of a sponsor in 12-step recovery. Uh, best of my knowledge, I spent $300,000 on porn and prostitutes. But that's not my big regret. That's just money. I spent my children's childhood. I spent in all 20 years of my wife's life and 20 years of my life trading my birthright day after day for a bowl of beans. Uh, we moved to, uh, to Middle Tennessee. I was still very active in my addiction, but nobody knew. We moved at the invitation of our oldest son and his wife who had moved there uh, because they had heard it was the best place in the country to raise kids and they were pregnant with our first grandchild and they wondered whether we would come and be with them. And my wife, who at the time was in clinical depression, no wonder, said, you know, I want to go. And so I took, anybody ever done the geographic cure to an addiction? The move is going to fix it? Yeah, right, right. I took the geographic cure and moved to Tennessee and uh, two things happened. Uh, on the way there, this crazy lady sitting beside me on the plane, when she found out I was thinking of moving to Nashville, told me that I had to move to Franklin, this town south of Nashville, which is actually where my son was, and that I had to go to a, this specific church. You have to go to this church. And she made me swear I would go, and she was a frightening lady. So, uh, turns out she was the singer Steve Green's mother-in-law. Um, so I, I told her I would, and I, I figured she'd probably check out my money. So, it turns out it was walking distance from this house we bought. And the pastor, pre, I'd grown up in church. I had a, a master's, of, I got a master's degree in God. I'd been a, you know, this guy preached the gospel. Grace, grace. <laughs> There's nothing you can do that can make God love you any more. And nothing you can do that make him love you any less. That kind of set the stage. And it would be great if just, uh, if teaching would help us, uh, would fix things. And, I, I, and I'm a good student, uh, always been a good student, good, uh, good test taker, always could excel. Um, I really thought that I was out of control because I had an information problem. I'd spent years looking for the final piece of the puzzle. What was the principle, the idea, what was the thing the mo what was the silver bullet? What did, I, what did other people know that I didn't know? That once I found the secret information would allow me to stop this crazy behavior. Well, it turns out I didn't have an information problem and there isn't any secret information. The gospel, <laughs> the gospel's hard to hear and hard to believe, but it isn't a secret. I didn't have an information problem. I had a relationship problem. 
I didn't have any friends. And I didn't know how to be with anyone. And I was sick. I'd spent years in church, you know, Sunday to Sunday. I'd go to, uh, go to church on Sunday, and I was active in, in church. I sang in the worship team, filled in for the preacher sometimes, taught Sunday school. Yeah. Privately, though, every week, week after week, I, I wrestled with my guilt. And so privately, I would confess my sin. To, so grateful I wasn't a Catholic and I didn't have to confess to another person. Uh, it was just, you know, nobody between me and God. I could go directly to him and ask for forgiveness. So I'd crawl to the foot of the cross and beg for forgiveness. And then I'd get this feeling, that, okay, I'm, I'm forgiven. That's what I, that was the limit of my understanding of what grace is. I spent years begging God for a forgiveness that was already mine because I didn't believe the gospel. And what I didn't understand was that forgiveness was a done deal. Done deal. But my sin had made me sick, and what I needed was healing. Now, I, my dad is a Pentecostal preacher, and I grew up going to healing services. Anybody ever do that? Ever been to a healing service? Pray for healing? Okay. So, um, uh, yeah, we were big on uh, miracles. We prayed for healing a lot. Occasionally, we'd see something remarkable. Um, but my understanding was that when God heals, he touches. And maybe you come forward at the end of a service, and you, make a, and you pray for God to touch you, and then he's going to hit you. You're going to get the lightning bolt, and now you're healed. You're fixed. I'd spent years begging for that. Every now and again, uh, a former alcoholic or a drug addict would come to our church and give his testimony uh, and about how you know, he led this life and then he met Jesus and boom, he's fixed. It always pissed me off. Because <laughs> God wouldn't do it for me. Let me ask you this. Um, can God heal addiction? Does he? Can he heal it instantly? Does he? Does he very often? No, usually he's got a much bigger agenda. But does that mean that God doesn't, he's not committed to our healing? If you want to know how committed God is to healing, take a look at the, the miraculous healing processes that he has designed into the human body. The way a broken bone mends, the way a cut closes, the way the body defeats an infection with a fever that spikes and subsides, those are miraculous. And they are progressive. Progressive, they take time. I've come to believe that Jesus, God has designed into the body of Christ. By the way, um, I had always been willing to trust Christ. I'd never been willing to trust the body of Christ. <laughs> in fact, I didn't even believe in the body of Christ. I thought that was a metaphor. I did not believe that Jesus is physically present on this planet, in the lives of broken people. But I believe it today. And the greatest act of surrender I make to Christ every day is to tell the truth to another member of the body of Christ. I believe that God has designed into the body of Christ, into us, into this collective thing, this organism, not an organization, into this organism of which you and I are a part, a healing process for all of us. It's described in James chapter 5, verse 16, where we're told to, anybody know it? Confess your sins one to another. What? To one another? For forgiveness? No, not for forgiveness. Forgiveness is a done deal.
It's not about forgiveness. Confess your sins one to another and pray for one another that you may be healed. By the way, the assumption of that, <laughs> of that, uh, of that verse, I think, is that any time we get together, everybody should have something to confess. In fact, the day that I don't have something to confess is the day I am in deep trouble. That's the day I have so limited my definition of sin to get it into a narrow spectrum of behaviors that I'm going to not do anymore and I'm successful for now and not doing them. And now I have become a successful Pharisee. And I'm in grave danger of crucifying again the Son of God. You know, one thing that strikes me about Jesus and his ministry, all we see of him in the Gospels is how unfailingly kind he was to the sexually broken. So kind. So gentle. In fact, the only people he ever denounced as adulterers were people who hadn't physically committed adultery. And they somehow thought that because they hadn't done that, they were better than the people who had. No, uh, what I didn't realize, <laughs> I walked into my first 12-step meeting. That's where I got my first taste of recovery. It would be a few years before we started the Samson Society for Christian Guys. But this was the South, so everybody in the room was Christian anyway. So... Uh, <laughs> Just about everybody. Uh, I was astonished by what I found in that room. I remember coming out of my first 12-step meeting mad, furious that I had spent a lifetime in church and I had never been in a room that safe. I'd never heard honesty like that in my life. I never heard such humility, felt such empathy, such kindness, love. I'd never heard Jesus like I heard him in that room from a bunch of people who didn't even seem to know his proper name. They kept referring to him as a higher power. And that was part of my problem. I, I, I had this attitude of spiritual and intellectual superiority, you know. Because I knew that my higher power could beat up their higher power. And so, uh, you know, I set myself as a missionary right from the start. I was a talker and not a listener. It took me a couple of years to get to really taste sexual sobriety and the freedom that's there. And that took some time in church to actually start to hear the gospel and understand that really it was about healing. And it wasn't, it wasn't even about the sexual behavior. It wasn't. It wasn't. I remember sitting down with my sponsor <laughs> to, to do my first, first step. Anybody ever done a first step? Okay. So I was going to do, uh, he asked me to kind of write out a sexual history because that was my deal. And, of course, a lot of it was foggy. I love what my friend Andy Gullihorn does when he sits down with a new guy. He says, look, I want you to tell me your story, and I want you to know up front I know you're going to lie to me. <laughs> It's because you've been lying to yourself and you can't help it. So do the best you can. And if later on you've got to walk anything back or change anything, there's no penalty. Just do your best. You got, I, I, something like that happened. I sat down with my sponsor. I, had, I spent days writing what I could remember. And I, I met him in a park. And we sat on a bench. And my hands are shaking. And I'm going to read this thing to him. And he says, hey, before we start, what's the one thing you didn't write down? I said, what do you mean? He said, the thing you didn't write down. I said, what, what makes you think I didn't write something down? He just looked at me and went, hmm. So I told him. He said, good, thanks. Now tell me the rest. And then we prayed and we gave it to God and we burned it. I remember uh, when I had my first relapse. By the way, for most of us, relapse is a part of recovery. 
I wish I didn't have to say that, and I'm not giving anybody any anybody permission to slip. It's not inevitable. It's not necessary. It is common if you're an idiot like me, and most of us are idiots. It's how we learn. But I so wanted to impress this guy, and I was wor uh, working so hard to be the star pupil because I'm going to set the land speed record for recovery. <laughs> I mean, I'm only there temporarily. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go through the course. I'm going to get this. I'm going to master the material. I'm going to pass the exam, whatever it is. I'm going to get the diploma, the green jacket, whatever it is, and then I'm gone. So uh, he wanted me to call him every day, and before I'd call him, I'd, I'd rehearse what I was going to tell him. And I'd call, and I'd give my good, you know, my insight of the day and my inspiration of the day, you know. So then I had to slip. I couldn't bring myself to call him. It took me a, a few days to call him. And then when I finally called him, I had it all set up. And I said, look, uh, toward the, I gave him the whole thing. And then toward the end, I said, hey, by the way, uh, I did have a slip last Tuesday, but I'm fine. And uh, it's good. It's good. I learned from it. And then I braced for the punch. And it never came. He said, man, I'm sorry. That must have sucked. I said, yeah, it sucked. He said, yeah. Well, let's take it apart and see what we can figure out. Tell me about it. That's grace. I don't know if you know this, but porn actually stimulates the same pleasure centers in the brain that cocaine does. Over time, changes the brain in the same way that cocaine does. We can see it now on brain scans. You know that part of Romans chapter 7 where Paul says, I don't know about me. What is this? This is nuts. The thing I want to do, I can't do. And the thing I don't want to do, I can't stop doing. Everybody know that part? Romans chapter 7, right? Yeah. A clearer description of addictive behavior has never been written. And by the way, he wrote that toward the end of his ministry, not at the beginning. And he wrote it in the present tense, not the past tense. And then he said this. So then. If I continue to do the thing I hate, it's no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells within me. That is, and here's a phrase he uses twice in three verses. He says, in my members. It's in me now. I'm sick. It's true. Addiction changes us on the neurological level. We need healing. We need support. And we need healing. And healing only comes, I'm going to, uh, I'm going to give you just, I don't know how much time, I, okay. I'm going to wrap this quickly, but um, you're old enough by now to know that life is difficult. This is true. Have you noticed? Life is difficult. Um, and if, when you encounter an obstacle, a difficult situation, when you find yourself in distress, physical distress, emotional distress, and you don't know how to process it, if you can't handle it, and somebody offers you a workaround, a shortcut, a way to distract yourself from or medicate that thing, and you can get around it, you're going to take it. And if it works at all, the next time you encounter a similar situation, the odds are you're going to take it again. And as you repeat that behavior, your brain, which is programmed for efficiency, the fewer decisions it has to make, the better. It's always looking to automate. It will eventually automate that sequence. The neurologists say the neurons that fire together wire together. A neural pathway is formed in your brain. And now you don't even have to think about it. In fact, once that thing gets wired deep enough, thinking about it can't stop it. 
I spent years doing irrational things for non-rational reasons, trying to solve the problem by rational means. Doesn't work. You know, you were born as a helpless infant. You couldn't take care of yourself. You couldn't feed yourself. You couldn't freaking roll over. You were completely dependent upon the care of giant strangers. Uh, they were the ones who were going to feed you. They were the ones who were going to change you. They were, and you had to keep them happy. You couldn't piss them off for long. Or you were going to die. You had fundamental needs as an infant. You had a need to be seen. Because you had no clue who you were. And you were going to read it from them. You had a need to be soothed when you were in distress. You had to have somebody to come and comfort you or change the diaper, right? You had a need to be safe. You had a need to be secure. And I'm assuming your parents loved you. I don't know whether one or both parents were there. But I do know this. No parent can do it perfect. Plus, there are circumstances that are outside your parents' control. There's all kinds of things that can happen that can make it so that time when you're in distress, nobody's there. Or there's so much else going on that you're just not seen. Or... Or some catastrophe hits and you get the clear message, it ain't safe. Now, hopefully enough of those needs are met when you're an infant that you are able, as you get older, to, secure, to trust, to securely attach to another person. We are uh, we're a species that needs each other. We are interdependent and the and the Bible says we are a body. We are not an organization. We're an organism whose members are so closely connected we can only move together. We are interdependent on each other. We cannot function alone. We're not made to. To do that, we have to attach. But if those needs are not met enough, even by loving, well-meaning parents, well... You can become kind of avoidant toward attachment. You can kind of make the conclusion that, you know what, I'm going to, I'm essentially on my own in this life. Nobody's going to take care of my needs for love. I really can't trust anybody completely. I'm going to tough it out on my own. I'll be glad to help anybody else, but I'm not going to ask for help because it's pointless anyway. Or you can swing to the other side and just become so insecure and needy and clingy that you can't do anything without asking somebody else their opinion. And, uh, and you're just absolutely at a loss if you ever have to be by yourself. Those are, in both cases, we need healing. In both cases, we need healing to get to the point where we can actually begin to attach, to risk, to become vulnerable, to connect, and to get met that need that is deepest in all of us. It's the one we were born with, the need for connection. Our God is a relational God. That crazy thing, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, so closely connected. They're one, but they're not, but they're... And they live in this dance of relationship and he made us for relationship with him and, and with each other. That's why when I asked God, I spent years begging him for a private solution to my private problem. That's what I wanted. So drenched in shame. He wasn't going to give me that. I believe he heard me Every time I prayed that prayer, and I think he gave me the same answer he gave the Apostle Paul when Paul begged on multiple occasions to be relieved of that thorn in the flesh, whatever it was, God said, mm, no. I know it hurts, and I didn't give it to you, but I love you too much to take it away because with it you're weak and you know you're weak, and when you're weak, I can be strong. I believe that God has allowed me to keep my vulnerability to sex to this day 
because it's the biggest lever in my life. It's the only lever big enough to force me out of isolation, despite my fear, and into honest relationship with other members of the body of Christ. I have friends today, not because I wanted them. I didn't want it. I wanted to attend that group. I didn't want to join that group. I'll close with this. A few years ago, my wife and I were at dinner, and we got talking about the night she caught me. And she said, uh, she said, you know, if you had died that night, I would have been relieved. She said, I wasn't going to kill you, but I would not have objected if God did. But she said, if you had died that night, I would have had a real problem on my hands because I would not have been able to call six close friends to carry your casket. Because I didn't have six friends. I was well known, but nobody knew me. And she had just discovered that even she didn't know me. Today, because God loves me too much to give me a private solution to my private problem. <laughs> my wife no longer has that concern. When I die, and I will die soon, my family will have no trouble finding six close friends to carry my casket. I will be carried in death by the same men who are carrying me in life. And I want you to know we're going somewhere. We've got, we've got a long way to go yet, but every now and again I turn around and see how far we come, and I am astonished. So my big question for you tonight, this weekend, is this. Do you know who will carry your casket? If you don't have those men, I beg you, Find those men. Thanks, brothers.